Thank you so much, Reverend McKenzie. Thank you for joining us, for leaving us in our devotion to tonight. Thank God for all who are on. Um, to those on the phone, I thank God for everybody who has participated in our worship experiences all day long, from 7 o'clock prayer to Sunday school to service to now to our expectation moment. I'm grateful for your continued and faithful participation in this work and this is the work that God has given us and also the study of God's word. I'm grateful today for another day to live in expectation to study God's word. As we have been in the book of Romans, I know some may have said, well, this is kind of complex, and it, and it is, but it isn't. It's not, it's, Paul was not trying to confuse anybody. Paul was trying to lay clear and make plain the path that we experience for righteousness. In other words, Paul wanted to say, if you can imagine him, he picked up each element that somebody might present, whether it being pro or con regarding salvation, and he laid it to the side. Can you can you get salvation? Do you just deserve salvation? No. Were you looking for salvation? No. Did you deserve it? No. Did you call out for it? No. Were you looking for it? No. He puts all those to the side to 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 really, I believe, to deepen the 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 gratefulness, deepen the the understanding of what thing, what great thing, what greatness is in the salvation that we have been given um, by God through Jesus Christ. It's given. He said it already. It wasn't what we earned. It was given. We received it. We received the gift of salvation from God, and not because we initiated not because we asked for it. God gave it to us out of his own love for us. And so that's what I think has, as we look at it and break it down to just one straight linear sentence, that's what has been presented in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Paul uh, explains that everybody stood in salvation, the evil, the moralizers, and the Jewish. He explained all these things repeatedly to give them clarity and understanding that uh, that that what we stand in need of um, is, is, is salvation, and the only way we can get it is, is to receive the gift, um, if, if, if receive it from God. Hold on one second. I'm sorry. I'm writing something down. So Paul is explaining, I mean, Paul is explaining that through these first three verses. Now, if we pick up in chapter 4, if we look at chapter 4 of Romans, what we see uh, is Paul takes the theme <clears throat> that was outlined. And this is why it's important. Get on here every night you can. And I will take a commercial break and say this. If you miss class, you can always go to our YouTube page and see it again. Uh, Sister Simpson uh, goes out each night and puts it on YouTube. So if you ever say, I miss class, you can always look at it at your own leisure. I want you all to know that that's a benefit uh, that we have. We thank God for Sister Simpson for setting that up every night so that we can check it out. But in Chapter 4, he moves now uh, and, and, and continues that theme of justification by faith. It has begun here in Chapter 3, uh, right about verse 21, and he continues the theme into Chapter 4, justification by faith. Or if I can say it like this, that we're declared righteous by God through our faith. So let's look at Chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, what shall we say then? When Paul asks this question, he's not he's not proposing the question. It's not even a rhetorical question. Paul is just lifting up another point. So now look at this, look at this right here. What should we say then that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh and found? What can we say um that Abraham's strength was? What can we say that Abraham, uh, our father, because he's the father of the faith, but it was really the father of the Jews, he said, How what can we say in regards to his life? Verse two, he says, For if Abraham were justified by works. He has a reason to, to boast, but he still can't boast before God. Paul, Paul, Paul says the reason why if, and this is a big question, if, if Abraham was able to be justified by works, he would then have reason for glory. But he couldn't glory before God. Why? Because even if he could, if, even if that was a method of working your way into salvation, Paul's point is we could never meet the high bar of the bar of, of salvation if it was up to work. So in other words, let's say, for example, the salvation required 500 hours of feeding the hungry, 100 hours of evangelism, and, and, and another 100 hours of, of helping the homeless. And, and I'm just sorry, another 100 hours of uh, helping widows or helping uh, um, uh, orphans. Let's say that was a part of the package. We could never, we would never, somehow or another, I, we would not be able to reach that bar on our own. Works wouldn't work for us. How many could agree with that? Works wouldn't work for us. If we had to work our way to salvation, we would never be able to get enough hours in. We'd never be able to get enough work in. So Paul said even if that was a possibility uh, that we could be justified, Abraham could be justified by works, he couldn't go before God and say, hey, God, I got it, because he wouldn't be able to meet the bar. Verse 3, he said, for what have the Scripture said? 
Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, if anybody was in Sunday school, they don't you remember this right here? This was in Sunday school. Uh, uh, um, um, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Why was Abraham declared righteous? Why was he justified? Because he believed God. And so Paul is kind of opening the door, if you would, because he's opening that door to let us understand the gift we got. We can't, we, if we could work to get it, we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to work to get it. If you understand what I'm saying. If that was a possibility, we still wouldn't meet the bar because we wouldn't be able to make the requirement of the work that was necessary to work our way to salvation. He says that salvation truly comes as a result of the fact that Abraham believed God. When, when God came and told him, you, all these stars in the sky, these will be yours. All these will be yours. Are you, this will this be how, how great um, those who come out of your loins will be. The Bible didn't say that Abraham challenged God. It said, well, God, give me some, more, some data points to give me some more information. He simply believed God. And the Bible says it was counted. It was put on his account for righteousness. That's what it was. And so I want to pause here and just be, and think about how good we have it. We don't have to work to we work from. All we have to do is do what? Believe. And therefore, our right, God's righteousness is imputed to us. See, this, God is the only person who can give you the power of the righteousness. There's no man ever has been that can walk that walk except for Jesus Christ our Lord. And God deposits that into our own our account as we believe in him and believe in Jesus as our Savior. So we can't, like I ain't got no depository of righteousness to give you. I don't have it because I'm, I'm glad I got mine. The deacons, mothers, deacons, nobody has a depository like, let me go ahead and direct the deposit for righteousness. Only God. And God says, I'm not going to give it to you because you work, because you can't work to get it. I'm going to give it to you. Just believe in me. That's, that's beautiful. That's power right there. I'm excited about God's plan of salvation right there. I'm excited that that's what God's plan was. If they just believe in me, I would put it unto their account for righteousness. Look at verse 4. Now to him, that worketh is reward, not reckon of grace, but of debt. He says, Again, he's kind of opened that door. If you can work for it, 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 it would, you would be operating from a place of debt. In other words, you'd be trying to work to pay it off. If you got a mortgage on your house or a car note, you're working to do what? To pay off, pay it off. So it's more of a debt situation. God, out of his love, simply asks us to believe, and he gives our righteousness. So there's no payback because God says, you believe in me, I'm going to give you righteousness. So we're not in debt. Instead, we are in relationship responding to the gift God has given us. See, it's a whole different ball game if, if somebody pulls up and gives you a card and says, okay, here goes your, you know, you pay um, your payment over 72 months, this is yours. Or if somebody just pulls up and hands you the key and says, this is yours, but I want you to have it. God has given us a gift because he wanted us to have it. And all we had to do was receive it by our belief. I wish I could, can, am, I, am I making some sense here? This is important for the Christian to understand. Why do we have joy? Because God gave us salvation through Jesus Christ. Why do we not have to be worried and, and tossed into and fro trying to see, did I make it, did I make it? Because God gave it to us. He didn't say you got to work for it. He said you got to believe in me, and I'll give it to you. And we're not, we're not in debt to God. We're working because God loved us. I want to say that again. We're not working out of debt by serving God. We're working out of love for God having saved us. That's all I want to say tonight. Verse 5. But to him that does work, but believeth on him that justifies the godly, his faith is kind of righteousness. He said the person who doesn't try to do it, but instead walks into a relationship with God by believing on God and receiving the, and having the kind of righteousness, that's the posture that we're in. And it did, it's not a laziness. In other words, it's not saying that you've got to just sit tight because James said faith without what? Works is dead. So the work we engage in is as a result of our faith as, a, as opposed to our work to be justified and declare righteousness before God. So he said if you work, and don't and don't accept the grace of God, you 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 short. But if you work, if you don't work, but believe it's on him that justifies ungodly God, his faith, God's faith is counted for right that person's faith, that person's faith is put into their account, their righteousness account. Verse six says, Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man on whom to unto whom God imputes righteousness their works. Y'all remember when David said that. David said, Blessed is the man. Uh, that 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 God has given him righteousness, imputed righteousness unto him without works. David, in the Old Testament concept, uh, understood um, that prior to him, that was a a labor in order to 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 have your sins covered. That was labor. That was sacrifice. That was offering. That was work, 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 just to have your sins covered. David says 
And there was no righteousness. It was just coverage of sin. David said, blessed is the man unto whom God imputed the righteousness. When I were blessed the man, then God simply says, your account is clear, and now your account is full. Your, your debts are paid, and now your account is full. That's what God is saying. And God said, blessed is the man. What are you saying, David? David says, the man that understands that through faith in God, through belief in God, that has received in the righteousness of God without works, is a person, a man that should be satisfied, should be happy, should be in a place where there's just no worry, no fear, no doubt, because you know that what you receive, it can't, it can't be renewed. It's done. God's work for us is done. Our belief in him is complete and total in receiving the righteousness of God in our lives. Paul said, that man is blessed. And so every now and then, when you feel a little down and a little off and kind of a little weary, say, I'm blessed. And if you might you might not have the car you want, the house you want, the job you want, it might be a little tired, but you can still say, I'm blessed. Why? Because God has imputed his faith, his righteousness upon onto me without me having to work for it. That's why we bless. That's why we bless. So it's just time to start a list of why we bless, okay? That's number one. We're blessed because God has imputed righteousness upon us without our works. Let me get one more verse here, if y'all don't mind. I, mean, I really meant to do just a few verses because y'all been up, y'all been with me all day. Like I've been up all day. But let me just give me a couple more minutes. Verse seven. He says, "Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered." That's a blessing. That's that's number two. God having God imputed righteousness on us without works is a blessing. But also those whose iniquities, sins, the nothingness that we've engaged in our lives that are forgiven that are taken away. So if we talked about that today, the word iniquity kind of speaks to the, the concept of that it's, it, it adds to nothing. See, iniquity doesn't get you anywhere. Instead, it takes away. Nobody on this Zoom line or phone line has probably ever had an overdrawn account. But it's, it's nothing. It's worse than being at zero. If you are zero, that means if you make a deposit, you will be in the plus category. But if you're negative, if you, and I know y'all don't know about this, but if you've ever been overdrawn, it, even if you make a deposit, you're still overdrawn. Paul, Paul is saying here right here. So the child of God, God has not only uh, covered our, um, t- taken away, forgiven us of our sins, brought us back to zero, but then he covers our sins. So now, and then as you connect that with verse 6, he's in Peter's righteousness. He, he takes away our debt, brings us back to zero, and then imputes us in, in righteousness into our account. So we went from being uh, in debt, we went to being overdrawn to having a full account simply by the work of God that came as a result of us believing in God. So we got so sometimes we got God imputes our righteousness with our words. That's number one blessing. We're blessed because of, because we have our iniquities forgiven. We're blessed because our sins are covered. But this this, this last one is even better. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's heaven. It's one thing to have um give you righteousness. But then when we are in Christ how do I want to say this? I want to say this in a proper way. It's one thing to have God give us righteousness without works. That's, that's great. That's great. It's another thing that God uh, gives us our iniquities, take our account out of, out of the red. It's another thing to say God covered our sin. Between these two, now we're in the black. But then the man whom the Lord would not impute sin, that God, because of our relationship with him, even when we, this is why we can say this. When John says when we confess our sins, God is what? He's faithful and just forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That means because of our relationship with God in Christ, that when we would, when we even when we have sinned, God has given us a provision that that sin does not get added to our account if we forget if we confess our sins. Let me be clear about that. You can't just do anything and say, well, you know, we talked about that at church day that that sin is 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 deadly. We know that. But as we are forgiven of our sins and God has given us provision through our relationship with God in Christ, as God has given us that, that means that we get a, when we sin, when we confess our sins, God would then do what? Not count it to our account as sin. That's a blessing. Because if it was just a one-time thing, we just got forgiven, but we had to walk and walk and say, oh, I don't want to mess up. Even, and that's why I love this, the scripture says that the Jesus is able to keep us from falling. Even when we fall in sin because of just the weak nature of our flesh, as we were aware of it, and this is what this was Saul's problem. Saul wasn't aware. Saul was so caught up in himself, himself. Saul didn't realize he was wrong. But when you realize you're wrong, when you see it, I pray this all the time. Lord, let me be aware. Let me not fall prey to reprobate my. Let me be aware of what I've done so that I can talk to you. When we come to that place and ask for forgiveness of our sins, God will be do what He will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's why we're blessed. That's enough, number four, says Thomas, because we are those who God will not impute sin on our account as a result of a vision he's given us through Christ. Last verse. This is it. Let me see what time it is. Our right, last verse. 
cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? He says, does this blessedness only come to those who are circumcised or does it come upon the uncircumcised also? He said, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. He said, now, is this a blessing only to the Jew or is it for everybody? He said, now, and, and Paul's making a, a case here. He says, because the, the, the point is that we're saying now that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. He said, so if that was it, if it wasn't because uh, of being a Hebrew, if it wasn't because of that, then it seemed like everybody should qualify for it if they simply uh, have faith. Have faith. That's the question. So he's saying now in verse um, verse 10, he says, this is how it's counted. How was it reckoned? What was the mathematical equation on it? When he was in circumcision or in circumcision, he's saying that it was, was, was the faith of, of Abraham accounted to him when he was circumcised or before he got circumcised. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. He's saying that, 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 that Abraham, that was not even a covenant at that time. So the law couldn't bring it about. Abraham was declared righteous before there was ever a covenant with God. He had his own covenant, and that covenant was one of belief and faith in God. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Moses had a covenant, but this covenant, this covenant was based upon belief. And so Paul is simply saying that nobody is excluded. No, um, racial history, no, Religious history, no uh, ethnic background, no uh, geographical location prevents you from experiencing this um, this 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 imputing of uh, imputing of righteousness or this blessing. It's not you're not you're not kept away from it as long as you have faith and believe in God. I'm going to stop there tonight, but I think that's something for us to go to go to bed on night. We should be grateful if you believe in God. And believe that Jesus is your Savior and God raised from the dead. If you believe that Jesus died for our sins and that God raised from the dead, we have a reason to be grateful every single day. Because God has done five, He's done four things for us. This is just four in these verses. He's imputed our righteousness without works. He's blessed us because our iniquities are forgiven, our sins are covered, and what he will not impute upon us to sin. And all we have to do is believe. Now, anybody what church you go to, what denomination, how long you've been in church, if you believe, God does these things for us. And that, my brothers and sisters, I close, is something to be thankful for. I'm going to stop tonight. Y'all been faithful and diligent to the Lord all day. But the day is 723 on this Sunday night, September 4th. And I pray as we go into this new month that God will bless us richly with his presence, his power, and the power of his presence. And I pray that this month we will grow closer to God and that we love and trust and believe and have faith in God more than we ever had before. God bless you. Let us pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, we say thank you for all of your blessings, all of your grace, and all of your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you and you alone have reached out to us, Lord, out of love and given us your only begotten Son, Jesus, and Savior. And thank you, Lord, we didn't have the strength uh, in our hearts to receive Jesus. By your grace, you gave us faith that we could receive the gift of God, that we could receive Jesus as our Savior. So now, God, I pray that as we leave um, and disconnect from these phone lines and Zoom lines, that you just help this stay ever before our mind, that we have blessedness in our lives simply because of faith and trust in you. I pray, God, you bless every household tonight, every every individual believer that's on these lines tonight, and every family that's represented tonight. I pray, God, this night that you would, by your love and by your power, Lord, I pray that you would, by your love and would, by your power, let your word get in our hands and feet that we can serve you better. Let your word get in our hearts that we may be strengthened in our inner man, that we will be strengthened in our inner man. Lord, let your word get in our in our ears that we can hear your word over everything else. God, let your word get uh, on our minds and in our minds. We might have peace that surpasses all understanding that the fiery darts of Satan will be quenched. God, let your word get on in our ears, on our tongue, on our lips, in our throats, and in our lungs, so we can declare your word to a dying world, to each other, and to ourselves. God, grant us peace, grant us joy. Grant us the capacity to love you and love our neighbor. God, we pray again that you build the head of the station around us that the fiery darts of Satan will be quenched. And God, give us the ability to, to give you thanks in all things because we know that this is your will for us in Christ Jesus. And finally, Lord, give us an understanding of the facts of our salvation that we can rejoice in you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.